morning. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Lively U Virtual Learning Academy program today. This program is our Care Compass project designed for caregivers who are currently caregiving and for those caregivers that are planning to caregive in the future. This program today is on isolation and its impact on your health. I welcome our first speaker, Jamie Jones. She's talking today about combating isolation through technology. Jamie Jones is with Critical Signals Technology, a Best Buy Health Company. Please welcome Jamie. All right. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here and speak on a topic that uh, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. So I'm going to start today by introducing myself and sharing a little bit about my work experience. I'm currently serving as the Director of Social Care at Best Buy Health. So yes, that is the same Best Buy that we all know and love. It's the consumer electronic company. Well, we're jumping into the healthcare industry and they've created a division called Best Buy Health. So back in 2019, Best Buy had acquired the company that I worked for called Critical Signal Technologies. And we primarily provided the personal emergency alert button, otherwise known as the help I fallen and can't get up button. We provided other various in-home safety devices to support older adults to remain safe, independent in their own homes. But our service model delivery was quite different than other companies as we encouraged our members to push their button for anything, including needs that support community services and outreach, transportation assistance, food or utility assistance and emotional support. So a team of individuals with social work degrees who provided these enhanced services when someone pushed their button for that type of need. So with the acquisition by Best Buy Health, I know I'll be spending the next few years growing our department and strategizing the expansion of our services to reach more people to provide this virtual care and other segments of the businesses of Best Buy Health. So one of the new pro newer programs that I will share that we're currently contracted with Centene, and Centene is a managed care organization, is our care companion program. Our social care team is providing monthly calls to members to help address socialization and loneliness. So overall, our purpose at Best Buy Health is to help enrich and save lives through technology and meaningful connections. I expect over the next few years, the public will see in Best Buy stores and hear more about the health offerings at Best Buy. So our agenda for the next 30 minutes or so is going to include uh, the senior care landscape and understanding a little bit more about that. We're gonna talk about social isolation and social determinants of health, technology support, and then thinking from concept to implementation when it comes to technology. Okay, so, so we'll start with the senior care landscape. So, oops, my apologies, I think I'm one behind. There we go, uh, state of the play. Older adults is a rapidly aging population. So if you think back in 1980, there were, 19, not 1980, excuse me, 1900, there were about 3.1 million people age 65 and older in the United States, which equaled about 4.1% of the total population. Jumping to 1950, there were 11 million people, 8%. Jump to 2018, 52 million people age 65 and older, or 16% of the population. Now thinking even further ahead, the number of Americans age 65 and older is projected to double to 95 million by 2060, being 23% of the population. And interestingly, it's projected that there will be over 3 million people worldwide aged 100 years and over by 2050. We're not only looking at a rapidly aging population, but also a population with growing life expectancy. The average life expectancy grew from 47 years old in 1900 
to 68 years old in 1950, then up to 78 years in 2015. Life expectancy in the U.S. for females is expected to rise 10 years from 80 to 85 years in 2015 to 90 to 95 years in 2050. For men, similarly, it will rise 10 years, but from 75 to 80 years up to 80 to 85 years. So the, for the first time in the U.S. history, by 2034, people aged 65 and older will outnumber those under the age of 18. So as the population grows exponentially compared to previous generations, and most of those people wishing to stay home, accommodating older adults will require more resources and definitely smarter technology. Healthcare expectations will continue to grow and change. 52% of people aged 65 and older will need some type of long-term care by 2030, 1.5 million age 65 and older will also require nursing home care. Now, what are the implications of COVID? Uh, of all COVID-19 related hospitalizations uh, were adults age 65 to 84, 59%. Disproportionately affected by COVID-19, adults age 65 and older have been forced to stay home for their safety increased feelings of social isolation and loneliness and challenged with how they're able to communicate with and get access to their healthcare teams. So we'll move on and we're gonna talk about social isolation and social determinants of health. So in the quest to develop engaging patient-centered delivery models, healthcare organizations are focusing more on social determinants of health. The social determinants of health refer to social and economic conditions that impact health and well-being of individuals, families, groups, and communities. The World Health Organization describes these determinants as circumstances in which people are raised, live, experience, grow, and age. So they include things like education, socioeconomic status, employment, housing, positive early life experiences, and access to social supports, and then lastly, food security. Studies have shown that experiencing social isolation and loneliness contributes to 45% of an increased risk of mortality in aging adults. Older adults with transportation access problems often face other challenges as a result. 64% are also food insecure and 59% have difficulty paying bills. Over 7 million people age 60 and over require assistance for food insecurity. Those are some pretty big numbers. In 2019, CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they're also who are responsible for managing the health insurance marketplace, they reinterpreted regulations to allow health plans to target certain supplemental benefits to specific subset of enrollees, enabling an improved ability to address these social determinants of health, so as a result of that, there's been updates to coverage plans that really point to a brighter future with being able to better assist in these areas. Food insecurity was at the top of the social determinant of health that payers chose to address in 2020. Daytime assistance for seniors was the second most prevalent benefit expanded. Unfortunately, transportation was the least covered, but it's still a definite uh, important part of getting older adults access to healthcare and community resources. So he's talking about the realities of social isolation. When you think about social isolation, it is a physical state. So it's when a person has little or no contact with others or the lack of a social support network. Now, loneliness, it's an emotional state. It's a feeling of being alone or separate from others. While social isolation can cause loneliness, that's not always the case. Studies have shown that more than 8 million adults aged 50 and older are affected by social isolation. 28% of older adults in the US, or think about it as 13.8 million people, live alone. 
43% of all older adults surveyed reported that they felt lonely, yet only 18% of them lived alone. So the remaining 25% lived in nursing homes or received some type of in-home care. 82% of older adults surveyed knew at least one person who was lonely, yet 58% would be reluctant to admit if they themselves were lonely. 57% that were surveyed said that they wished they had more close friends in their life. And 70% age 64 and older agree that experiencing partial hearing or vision loss would make them feel less comfortable being out in public or interacting with friends and family. So we'll talk a little bit about health risks of social isolation. Coupled with the fact that older adults are less likely to receive treatment for depression caused by social isolation, this increases risks associated with various mental illnesses. According to the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, adults over the age of 65 are notably less likely to receive mental health treatment when compared to younger adults. Research, researchers, they've identified the barriers that contribute to poor access and inadequate use of mental health services by older adults, including things like the lack of perceived need for care, the lack of knowledge about availability of mental health services, stigma limited availability of affordable services, and difficulty arranging transportation, all barriers of getting help. Then there's a higher risk of physical conditions. So those listed here like high blood pressure, obesity, weakened immune system, anxiety, depression, and so on. With social isolation becoming an increasing issue, more and more healthcare systems like Anthem, United Healthcare, Kaiser, Centene, they are all rolling out plans to mitigate these effects. So that's very encouraging and very exciting. So we'll transition into technology. What are, what are some technologies out there that can help uh, with social isolation, making sure people are safe in their homes? With technology, older adults are able to seek assistance for everyday needs, not just emergencies. Historically, you think of that iconic 80s commercial, help I fall and I can't get up, there's an ambulance that come. It's not the case anymore. It's not just for emergencies. This empowers them to have control over aspects of daily living that previously required complicated assistance. It helps address social determinants of health, it also allows healthcare workers the ability to intervene earlier, resulting in better health outcomes at a lower cost. So it used to be that the older adult population were not considered tech savvy, not being open to technology, but studies are now showing that this is quite the opposite. We are finding older adults nowadays to be much more open and interested in technology. I will say first that my father is on Facebook I think all the time and he's quite embarrassing. So it, it is kind of fun to see him accepting social, social media and technology now. So some of the statistics that we found, 10% of adults aged 55 and older were currently using some type of wearable device. Love my Fitbit. 36% <laughs> have used a ride hailing service like Lyft or Uber. 92% stated that an improved quality of life was experienced after using some type of ride sharing service. 17% have used online grocery shopping or meal prep service. I have a feeling that that percentage now is a bit higher. These percentages were pulled uh, a little bit ago. So I think that one's probably gone up with COVID. And then lastly, uh, 95% of older adults would use medical technology if their physicians recommended it, and 91% would use that medical technology if it lowered their insurance costs. How about if their insurance provided it free of charge? That's even better, right? Social interaction through technology. So older adults 
they, as I said, they are embracing technology and social media at greater rates. This is providing opportunities to combat social isolation virtually. In 2019, 51% of older Americans say that they bought some type of tech product. Those top purchasers and in purchases included a smartphone, there was 23% there, computer or laptop, 12%, a smart TV, 11%, tablet, 10%, some type of ho smart home technology or device at 12%, and then wearable devices at 7%. 67% reported that they do have access to the internet. Three out of four internet users say they go on at least daily, and 51% of those do several times a day. 34% use social media sites like Facebook or Twitter. And 58% feel technology has a positive effect on society. Online video games, or perhaps those card games, those are also becoming more popular with older adults. And the top four social media platforms ranked as used by older adults. The first one, Facebook, 46%. The second, YouTube, 38%. Pinterest came in at 15% and LinkedIn came in at 11%. Applications of technology. So the active, agents, the active aging industry in the United States which includes safety and smart living technologies, health and remote care, and wellness and fitness technologies is expected to triple in the next three years to nearly a $30 billion industry. There are many applications of technology that we can tap into to help address social determinants of health, isolation, and loneliness. PERS technology, again, that's that personal emergency response system that help by phone and can't get up type service. They not only allow older adults to remain safe and independent in their homes and get access to help during an emergent or non-emergent need, it also gives them someone at the touch of a button that they can talk to. And as I said, uh, our model of service delivery is to encourage our members to press their buttons for any needs that they have, including emotional support. They have a friendly person to talk to. And, and I'll just share that over the years, and, and I've been doing this, I, I think I celebrate my 23rd anniversary this year, um, there's just nothing more meaningful for employees that are on the other end of the button when they can talk with someone and brighten their day and to have an organization that actually supports that social interaction rather than get off the phone quickly. Uh, it's just, it's, again, that goes back to that meaningful connections with people. So it's just been a rewarding career from my standpoint. Okay, so moving on, uh, smartphones. Now they have clocks to help older adults keep track of time, alarms and reminder messages to remind older adults of meal times, medications and other actions, as well as photos and video calling to remember their loved ones and support systems. And perhaps you've heard of the company Great Call. They are the company that invented the Jitterbug cell phone for seniors. That is another company now of Best Buy Health. So Best Buy Health owns Great Call. And I think if you were to go into some of the Best Buy stores, you'll actually see the Jitterbug product. So wonderful cell phone designed specifically for older adults. Now, another industry that's rapidly growing, especially with COVID, is telehealth. So telehealth is a technology for seniors and a way for them to access medica medical care. Telehealth provides various technologies in healthcare settings that include things like providing tablets with peripheral devices that can track disease specific symptoms. Telehealth software can include educational material, 
vital sign monitoring, the weight, the blood pressure, the glucose. Uh, they can do medication reminders. They can have various forms of communication. It can be electronic communication, but there also can be another person at the end of that peripheral monitoring their uh, vital signs and results and calling them if something uh, doesn't come in within a parameter that's expected. So there's a lot of communication that can go into those programs. Um, they also can do wound imaging visuals. Telehealth allows the patient's clinical team to identify and treat abnormal results as soon as possible. So as telehealth starts to develop, there are significant advances in communication technology, including video conferencing and connectivity, allowing seniors to virtually connect with their doctors, nurses, and care teams. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization lists telemedicine among services to expand in response to concern over exposure for seniors. So telemedicine visits increased at an average compound annual growth rate of 52% from 2005 to 2014. I'm excited to get my hands on what that's going to look for last year, this year, uh, in the impacts that COVID has had on that technology. Going into GPS or location-based services, it's a way to allow seniors to stay safe in their communities. GPS has been around for decades, but in the last 10 years, they have been greatly improved location accuracy and the detail that the satellites is able to convey. So the accuracy is so much better now than it was in the past. This type of technology allows care teams and monitoring centers to identify when a patient with maybe dementia, maybe memory loss has wandered outside of their typical movement zone. They can send help to their exact location should that help be needed. Emergency response services, those PERS button again, uh, they can have GPS, they can be mobile, so they allow seniors to access emergency care as soon as possible. So if they fall, it can provide that sense of security that should they feel lost, afraid, or confused, they can get immediate assistance. COVID aside, these technologies support and encourage older adults to safely leave their home, take public transportation, and interact with the community and know that if they need any type of support, help, they can push the button and someone will be speaking with them immediately. Now we've got also detection devices that can identify falls without any participation needed from the patient. Advancements in fall detection, they limit fall-related injury, ER visits, and potentially deaths, empowering those older adults to remain independent and feel safe in their day-to-day -day lives. Newer technology that we're seeing come out and it's advancing rapidly are things like voice activated assistance. Though it does require an understanding of the technology, voice activated assistance like those from Amazon, Google, they can be programmed to play music, read audiobooks, tell jokes, play games, and even answer questions. Home monitoring devices. This technology allows remote caregivers to turn lights on and off, adjust the thermostat to allow uh, for even uh, other ranges of safety measures in the home. And you've got cameras, motion sensors, uh, various things that you can do with those as well to address safety. So just to revisit a, a little something I mentioned earlier, uh, new policies empowering self-care, empowering older adults to use technology that offers a sense of control in managing their own health, boosts self-esteem and satisfaction. As mentioned earlier, changes in Medicare and insurance policies are allowing for coverage of personal monitoring devices and other services that empower older adults to manage their own health and adopt different forms of technology. With all of the changes and efforts to support social determinants of health, it is very important for caregivers, healthcare professionals to really investigate and then learn what technologies are, are a covered benefit through your loved one's insurance company. Sometimes you just got to ask. The reality is technology advances 
can directly benefit the elderly and help promote aging in place. And through the use of technology and communication, older adults can see decreases in loneliness and in turn experience better mental and physical health. Greater technology use studied and found to be associated with, with better self-rated health, self fewer chronic conditions, a high sense of well-being, and lower depression. By following these few actionable steps I have listed as care teams, we have the ability to help assess the older adult's needs, identify those appropriate solutions, and help them gain access to the right technology at the right time to help them remain safe and independent. So healthcare professionals that caregivers work with can help older adults leverage technology by offering personalized advice regarding what technologies are best suited for their unique health and lifestyle needs. And there really does need to be an assessment. Uh, you, you have to look at um, cognitive abilities and, and the ability to actually use the technology. So there's an assessment that needs to go on. We need to ensure that older adults are trained on any new technologies and they have access to all of those necessary tools. We should be taking the time to check in with the older adults to ensure that things are running smoothly once they adopt some type of technology. We should remain relationship centered, tapping into virtual technology to stay connected from a safe distance when it's required or necessary. And then we should be educating the public on older adult needs in order to further enable them to age in ways that align with their choices. That's one of the things I've enjoyed over the 20 years is I have a direct impact on those engineers that are developing these technologies. And I try to represent an older adult's point of view as they design and develop these things as they aren't always thinking that way. Concept to implementation, we are, we are coming to the, our last couple of slides, and these are really just things to consider regarding technology and the support that can be provided. It is important for us to understand the challenges as implementing a high-tech, high-touch approach. It's still relatively new, and it's not without its limitations. So some examples we have listed here is some older adults, they can feel shame, embarrassment, or a reluctance to ask for help or support. They don't wanna be a bother. We get that most often, they don't wanna be a bother. So we're going to need to work with them. We have to ask questions. We have to provide them with the education and support that they need. We can reassure them the technology is here to help meet their goals of safety and independence. We will need to work seamlessly with their entire care network when helping older adults with their needs and addressing social determinants of health. Their social workers, their healthcare providers, their caregivers, it's one big team. Insurance and payers vary widely when it comes to covering these emerging technologies. So we're gonna need to know what their insurance covers and what, the, what other funding sources are available for our clients in their communities. Older adults may have had negative prior experience with technology, so we will need to understand and meet them where they are, and again, provide the education to help ease them into adopting the right technology to meet their needs. And their needs will be changing, so those technology opportunities will continue to change. Actionable steps. The reality is technological advances can directly benefit the elderly and help promote aging in place. And through the use of technology and communication, seniors can see decreases in loneliness and in turn experience better mental and physical health. Greater technology use studied found to be associated with better self-rated health. Again, fewer chronic conditions, High, how, high well-being and lower depression. By following these actionable steps we've talked about, we are able to identify the appropriate solutions, help them gain access to the right technology at the right time. And 
that brings us to the close of the presentation. I do believe we've got some time for questions. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm going to go ahead and um, allow anyone to um, unmute themselves at this time if they have a question they want to share, or you can just enter it in the chat feature. You're welcome to do that. Any questions for Jamie today? Oh, Carol. Carol, so you're going to have to unmute yourself, Carol. Yep, go ahead. Well, I just think she covered it so thoroughly. I feel like we have all we can do to absorb all the information. And I, I think the presentation is very good. Thank oh. you, Carol. Thank you. Anybody else with a question for Jamie today? Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, Carol, you have another question. You go ahead and unmute yourself. I just said goodbye now. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> That's all I said. Okay. Thank you. I guess, Jamie, I'll have a question for you. Um, what is the most popular? Well, I think Emmy. Does Emmy have a question? Go ahead, Emmy. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. I do. Um, it, very um, knowledgeable presentation. Uh, but one of the last comments on there was um, to the effect of um, the changes in the technology and keeping us acquainted. Um, and that is really one of my concerns. My iPhone was recently updated. Uh, I can't set an alarm on it anymore. Um, my 90 year old adaptation doesn't work as fast. Uh, so is there any way to um, get technology to uh, give us a little more warning when it's going to change or give us more instruction? Yeah, I, th sense? I think that that is an absolute great call out. And, you know, in my experience in, in the devices and the company and the technology that I've worked with, I always recommend that you, there are so many different providers. There's Apple, there's Samsung. And I mentioned today there's there's Jitterbug. And when I'm assessing my clients and the needs that they have, I really try to do the best research on those companies and what kind of support services they offer. So, you know, I know Jitterbug is part of Best Buy Health, but I, I do have to advocate that they are a cell phone for seniors. So their customer service department is specific to helping older adults through the technology. So so I, I think that we as, as providers and in, in social workers and we're working with people, we have to do our research to help direct which companies are going to be able to provide the best support to the aging population. Thank you. Perfect. There is a question, Jamie, in the chat feature I'll go ahead and ask. And they said, thank you for offering this wonderful program. And they were asking for your contact information, but maybe I just a call out to Lawrence and just maybe in regards to what information he was looking or they were looking to obtain. Hmm. And I think I unmuted you. Um, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Lawrence. I apologize if that's not your first name. Hi. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, it just general information and I'm just gathering information at this point. So nothing really specific. Okay. Um, so I'm going to see if I can do a quick search so I can give you something right now. I love when I get questions um, about the the services uh as far as how do i go about get you, getting your services and i so i'm not from the sales department so i always get a little stumped like how you know i can tell you about what we do uh, i think the best 
thing, and, and it depends on who you're working with because there are, in, in the demographics of who your loved one is, you know, are, do they qualify for Medicaid? Do they qualify? Are they on managed care? What's, what is their insurance company? Because you should always start with whoever your insurance company is to see if they cover what types of technology more and more they're covering more. Um, so that's the first place to start is go to your insurance company and say, I want to know what technology is available for my loved one. Um, and, and if you're in that threshold where the income is, is higher than all of the eligibility requirements, then there's always a private pay option. And when someone has to go to the private pay option, I always send them to uh, the Great Call website. So we're still transitioning. Best Buy Health is so brand new. Greatcall.com is where someone would go if they know that they aren't in a lower income or in a managed care situation. And I'm looking at the phone number for our Great Call sales team, and it's 1-800-918-1111. Five, four, three, and they have a wonderful team that can answer any questions as to what our products and services are. Great. And I will go ahead and share that in the chat feature so that everyone has access to that number if you didn't catch it the first time from Jamie. Um, as a reminder as well, we are recording this presentation, so you feel free to welcome um, you to share this information on our YouTube channel, Wood County Committee on Aging, Inc. And you can share that with family members as well. So, any additional questions um, today for Jamie? I guess I just had a really quick question before you, um, you have to head out, Jamie, is what is the most popular technology feature you guys are utilizing? The most, po the most popular right now um, is our mobile PERS device. So that is a, a, you know, it's about yay big. It's not too, too big. It can be worn around the neck or around the wrist, but it's mobile. So it's not just in home where traditionally, if you had a PERS button, it had to be in your home. Well, this gets you out in the community. And if you do press that button, we're talking to you through the button. So you can get access to the care team anywhere that you are. And the one story that I just loved uh, was this, this woman who moved to a new community and it was more of an urban community and she had to take public transportation for the first time. And she pushed her button and we talked to her the whole time she was on public transportation to help keep her anxiety down. So just, just what a wonderful story of a way to utilize this technology outside of your traditional I need an ambulance. I just love that story. So when they do receive this equipment, you do like ample training with them to show them how to utilize. Different that's right. There's, there's reading material, if that's a preferred method. And then there's a support staff that's available to really walk them through, answer any questions. Perfect. Well, you have enlightened us and provided us with the most valuable information on a really great resource that may be out in our community. So we appreciate your support of our program today and your time and um, look forward to um, some Best Buy products in the future. So thank great. you so much. Everyone, you are so welcome. It was my pleasure. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and continue with our program today. And so our next part of our feature, and we wanna take a moment too as well and thank Brookdale uh, senior Living for providing our lunch to all of us today. Um, but the next part of our program is our panel discussion on community resources to create connections and support while being socially isolated. So I'd like to welcome our panel and begin with our first speaker today. We have a Jessica Ricker. She is from a social worker and represents the Wood County Committee on Aging. Hi, actually, um, I believe Allie's going to start us off. Okay. Um, she's gonna talk about what she um, knows here in the community. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Allie here. So just one moment, please. Oh, 
Ali? Okay, so hello everyone. Um, Jessica, I don't know, are you sharing the presentation or am I? I have it up. Okay, um, so do I. And so if you want to drive, that's fine with me. Um, so, hello. Um, I'm Allie Longmore. I am the home health social worker from Ohio Living Home Health and Hospice Greater Toledo Division. Um, we provide home health and hospice services for a 10 county region of Northwest Ohio. I am an independent, uh, a licensed independent, independent social worker. Um, and I'm certified as a clinical trauma professional. Um, and I'm very happy to join you today. So, I'm gonna flip to the second one. I'm not sure what's showing. It disappeared. This, okay. Okay, are you seeing the second yes. slide? Okay, wonderful. Um, so how tired are we of the word pandemic? But since the pandemic beca began, it's been, become increasingly evident how important socialization is to our collective mental health. While all of us have felt the impacts of the necessary distancing, research indicates that over those over 50 have been the most negatively affected. You'll notice the graphic there, that is from a study done um, by the University of Michigan, and it's shown the difference between the feelings of isolation in those over 50 from 2018 as opposed to 2020. Predictably, those living alone are the most vulnerable to these feelings of loneliness and isolation, but research also noted that women and those with lower incomes also experience an increased impact. Chronic health challenges can increase isolation during normal times and can put people with chronic illnesses at greater risk of developing symptoms of depression and anxiety. This is due to a number of factors, including side effects of medication, chronic pain, and physical changes such as impaired hearing, vision changes, cognitive changes, and incontinence issues. Conversely, research indicates that depression can increase the risk of development of chronic illnesses. Mental health and physical health are closely interrelated and both should be monitored by caregivers and healthcare professionals. The contact restrictions in place in hospitals and rehabilitation facilities can be difficult for patients and their families. The necessary separation from loved ones during an already stressful health event can lead to increased anxiety and or depression. Research has indicated that patients are experiencing trauma reactions called medical PTSD, and the subsequent symptoms can be very challenging for patients and their caregivers. Many of the patients that we care for at Ohio Living have had recent hospitalizations and rehabilitation stays, and I've seen the emotional distress that has resulted from these forced family separations. I find that I've been treating significantly more depression, anxiety, and trauma than in previous years. It's important to understand that depression symptoms aren't limited to just bad feelings. Irritability, appetite and sleep issues, fatigue, or physical symptoms might indicate depression. So how can we stay well? Here are some strategies, some that are familiar and maybe some not so much. Meditation. Even two minutes can make a difference if you're feeling on edge. If, if you've never meditated before, you can try some online resources. You can use search terms like guided meditation or progressive relaxation. There are a lot of them to choose from and they're in a variety of lengths and of narrators. So if you find one that you don't like the person's voice or you don't like the background sounds, um, there's a lot of them. And I would really encourage you to look into those. Sleep. 
Maintaining a regular sleep schedule can help manage stress. Your body may need more rest when it's stressed. I recommend limiting naps, however. This will help you keep to a regular sleep-wake schedule. Again, maintaining a regular meal schedule is important. Don't skip meals. Keep healthy snacks on hand and practice mindful eating, meaning pay attention to what's going in your mouth. Laugh. Research has shown laughter to be therapeutic and studies have indicated that even pretending to laugh has mental health benefits. There is even such a thing as laughter yoga. <laughs> Take a break. Treat yourself to a mental break. Listen to music or again, you can hop online and there are wonderful resources for you to listen to a few moments of bird song or nature sounds or whatever strikes your fancy. Give yourself that gift of that little break. Limit alcohol and caffeine. Both of these can affect depression and anxiety symptoms. Breathe. If you're experiencing a moment, stop. Take 10 slow, deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. It helps to remind your body to slow down and relax. Talk. Whether it's to loved ones on the phone or to a trained professional, talk. Insurance rules are considerably relaxed now regarding telemental health, and you can speak with a trained therapist at home, um, and you don't have to wear a mask, which is a bonus. Antidepressants are often considered a bad word, um, but they are medications that are to treat depression symptoms. They can improve the way your brain uses certain chemicals that control your, control your moods and your stress. When combined with talk therapy, the positive effects of medication can be increased by 50%. Be mindful of what you take in over media. The TV news shows are designed to keep you watching. I recommend limiting daily exposure to TV and radio news programs to 30 minutes or less if you're experienced, experiencing symptoms of depression or anxiety. And physical activity, try to avoid the bed, kitchen, sofa lifestyle. Try to do some physical activity every day for both your motion, physical and emotional health. As Jamie noted, people are frequently reluctant to reach out when they're not feeling great. If you're feeling emotional distress, here are some numbers you may wanna keep on hand. Please don't suffer in silence. There's always someone willing to listen. So that's it for me. Thank you for asking me to participate and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, since you're from the healthcare field, we're gonna go ahead and just, um, home health, actually. We're gonna go ahead and um, open it up to a couple questions. If anyone has any questions about the home health field and with the current COVID situation, how that may impact them at all. I will try to answer. Does anyone have questions in regards to that? I'll go ahead. I can allow you to like unmute yourself if you have any questions about home health and the current COVID situation in isolation. All right, so it looks like everyone is pretty good right now. So we're gonna go ahead and continue with our next speaker. And um, Jessica, I'm gonna turn it back over to you if that's okay. All right, perfect. Well, I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, so I just wanna follow up about what can we do about what Ali would ju had just spoken about. It's such a difficult time um, and it's really important that we try to continue or we try to connect with others in the safest way possible. 
So I just want to go ahead and talk about some of the community resources that we are offering here at the Senior Center. Um, okay, so right now um, we are offering the Friendly Visitor Program. So that's been something that has been ongoing here at the agency, but the purpose is really to connect an older adult with a, um, a volunteer, somebody that's been background check um, and has taken the training and gone through the appropriate things to, to know what they're doing. Um, so this would be something that the volunteer would commit a, at least four hours to creating a schedule with the older adult um, and spending time with them just to communicate um, whether that's a phone call or actually going to their place and visiting, um, obviously taking the safety precautions. Um, but that's been a really helpful program um, at our agency just to connect individuals with somebody that is a different person in their life. Um, so that is an option. If people are interested, they can certainly give us a call and, and we can give them more information about how to get involved and how to get their name on a list to get connected with a volunteer. Um, right now, we're also doing wellness calls. So that's something that we just started throughout the pandemic. We are contacting people three times a week um, and bugging them and just uh, checking in with them and seeing how things are going and just seeing how their lives are going and just talking to a different person is just helpful throughout this time. We've really found that people really do enjoy it. Um, and to get involved with that, they again, um, just have to give us a call and, and we can connect with them and it's individuals from our social services department that are making the calls. Also, there's a, a national line. So if you are feeling lonely and you just want to chit chat with somebody new, um, you can contact the friendship line. And that's a 24 hour line that is available to 60 plus individuals. So they can contact that line and just have a, a conversation um, with a new person. So that's something that you can stay connected um, throughout this time. So the Wood County Sheriff's Office, they have a program called Are You OK? Um, it's not necessarily the connection that you're looking for, maybe, if you want to talk to a, a person and have a conversation about your day. Um, but this is more of a, a check-in program just to see if you are alert and you are all right. Um, so you can get on a list with them and they will call you each time at this uh, designated time that you choose. It is a pre-recorded message, um, but they designate the time on a specific day of the week and you choose that and you work that schedule out with them. Um, if you don't answer, then the system will call you back and try again a number of times. And again, if you don't answer that, then they will send out a deputy just to make sure that everything is going okay. Um, and you can call that number there that's listed and they can give you some more information about the program and um, sign you up if you are interested. Um, and some of the things that we do here at the Wood County Committee on Aging. So if you are um, right now in your home and you're independent, um, and you're looking just for something extra, we do offer these home delivered meals. So typically they are for individuals that are homebound and unable to get out and about in the community. Uh, maybe you can't do your grocery shopping or you feel like you're relying too much on others. Um, maybe the home delivered meals are a good fit for you. Um, those are something that we can sign you up for and we deliver those Monday through Friday um, around the noontime hour. And it's just a suggested donation of $2 per meal. Um, we also offer medical transportation. So if you're looking for transportation um, to your appointments, we can offer that three times a month and it is just a donation, uh, but we travel all over the county. We can go up into Lucas County and down to Finley as well. Um, so that is something that may be helpful to individuals that might not be uh, going out and about as much as they, much as they hope to. Um, we do offer the Durable Medical Equipment Loan Closet. We have all kinds of things back there. So if you have a spell and you're needing a walker or a wheelchair just for a temporary time, um, you can give us a call and we can hook you up with that. And we do loan that equipment typically for six months and it is just a donation. Um, and another thing that not a lot of people, sometimes they don't know about this program, um, but here at the agency, we work with the Area Office on Aging to offer a minor home repair program. So with that, um, it is an application process and we can assist those who might need help filling out the application, but it is just an application and it, this is for home repair that would be kind of like a health or safety hazard to the individual. Um, so if they need something to make their bathroom a little bit safer, 
to continue living safely in their home. Um, we can help out with bathroom modifications we've done. Uh, we've done railings on porches. Um, we've done ramps. So things like that to kind of help you stay in your home as, as long as you can. Um, we can help you fill out that application and it gets sent off to the area office on aging. And we coordinate that together and we work together on that program. Um, so something else. If you are a caregiver, um, this has been an extremely challenging time uh, trying to connect with others. And, um, you know, it's it's so nice to have this uh, support group or a network of people that kind of understand what you're going through. Um, and I know that within the past year that, you know, people haven't had that. They haven't had that connection. So we are going to start offering the caregiver support groups in person again, um, but on a reservation basis. Um, so this is for anybody that's providing caregiving assistance to individuals throughout Wood County. Um, we try to provide resources, um, advice on stress of caregiving, recommendations, and it's really just an outlet to connect with one another. Um, but we, in Bowling Green, we typically offer those um, the second Monday of each month at 2.30, and we will have one coming up this Monday. So if you are interested, um, you can give me a call and, and we can get a reservation for you. Um, at the Bowling Green group, we do offer respite. So if you do want to bring your loved one in, um, you can bring them in and, and we'll do some type of activity or just keep them engaged and converse. Um, we are going to start offering a new group up in Perrysburg at the senior center there. Um, and that's going to be in the morning at 10 o'clock, um, starting the fourth Thursday. And that's going to begin in March. So if you are interested in these um, caregiver support group opportunities, um, you can certainly reach out to me and I will um, put a reservation in for you. And I'd love to meet you and, and connect you with other caregivers. Um, one more thing I just wanted to backtrack to the sheriff's office. Um, one more program that they offer to kind of make you feel safe in your home is um, if you are caregiving for somebody and they may have some um, memory issues going on and they're starting to wonder, there's a program called Project Lifesaver. Um, so Project Lifesaver, again, it's through the Wood County Sheriff's Office. Um, so this would be kind of like a, a wristband. It's battery operated. It's a radio transmitter that emits these um, tracking signals and it does it every second uh, of the day. So um, if, you're, if your loved one started, started to wonder and you happen to lose track of them, um, you would contact the sheriff's office and they would be able to find your loved one um, as quickly as they could. This is, again, it's an application and um, we are involved. We do about a, a little interview just to kind of get some more information about them. We fill out a little bit of uh, personal information, you know, some of the things that they like, where might they go. Um, so this that type of thing. And then the sheriff's office, they have an individual that would come out and also interview the person just so on both ends we can kind of get that um, all the information we'd need to make them safely found and returned home. Um, and again, if you are interested in that, you can contact um, Deputy Eric Reynolds for more information about that program. Um, and that is all I've got. So if you have any questions, I would love to answer those. I had a question. Yeah. Um, the Wood County Sheriff prog Program, the Are You Okay? You said that they would call, is it just once a week or can you ask for that daily if you're, say, you just home from the hospital or something like that? I believe it's just uh, once a week, but I, I don't know if they ha offer that more times. That would be uh, something to look into. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Do we have any, uh, any other questions from um, our participants? I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Hi, um, I've heard that there's some type of a lock box or something that you can place on, on your front door yes. for um, assistance from what I, I'm not, I don't know the name of it. Knox box. Yes, the Knox box program. Okay. How does that work? Um, so I think it's if you, you know, if you, if the emergency came about and they needed to get into your home, then they would have that um, box on your door and it would have your key or something to get in. Um, but as far as how you get into that, I don't have that information on hand, but I can certainly send that to you. 
I appreciate it. The name of it is Knox. Yep. Is it? I think it's K-N-O-X. -O yeah. Okay. And do um, you find out information from the police, local police, or how do you um, yes, access the, it? Right. I can look this up because um, it's, it is a fairly new thing. Um, but I do have information on it and I can certainly send that to you. Um, okay. Maybe we'll go ahead right, and thank you. any other questions we can allow the other speaker to speak and then um, Jessica can share that information. Um, yes. Yeah. Before we finish today. So perfect. So any other questions from any of our participants here today? No. Okay, we're going to go ahead then and um, allow our next speaker to join us. Kathy West is, is joining us here today. Did it work? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Kathy Myers, actually. Sorry. I, I work at, that's okay. I, I'm the social worker at Woodhaven Healthcare here in Bowling Green. And I don't have such a formal presentation today, but just kind of give some general updates. Um, obviously with COVID, the nursing homes have been hit very hard as everyone's well aware. Uh, we've been pretty fortunate here um, in that we've had very limited cases. Um, but it's, it's been an extremely difficult year at every level, especially the mental health portion of it. Um, I just, just to mention up front though, we have been able to continue to accept admissions um, for every level of care. We've had Medicare skilled admissions, intermediate admissions, hospice, and we do do respite stays as well. And obviously we do the discharge planning on the flip side. Once you're here, you get to go home again. Um, I know some people have thought once they get in here, they can't leave. I don't know why, but they can leave. Um, <laughs> and making referral to the home care companies, um, lifeline services, a lot of the things we've talked about with the senior center, the meals, uh, medical equipment's another big one. So. I was very glad to get the information on some of the technology updates. Um, I'm gonna have to check into some of those things from my end as well. Um, but for the mental health portion of the COVID, certainly obviously we've seen increased depression, increased isolation. It's very frustrating and for people not to be able to have their families come into the building. Uh, unfortunately, with us being a red county at this point, we're still not allowed to have visitors inside. Um, we have definitely used the telehealth options for people, whether they have their own tablets or we have several here in the building that we can use and take so people can connect with their families. Um, we do allow window visits, which of course in January is not great but um, we do allow for that. Um, in the summertime, we were having some outside visitation opened up and we certainly are hoping in the near future, we'll be able to you know, reopen up to more visitation, especially with the vaccines starting to happen. Um, but we have access here to a, um, it's called the Psych360 group. That's uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners that we do telehealth with every month. And we will take them to anyone who's interested in talking with them. They offer support, counseling, medication management to help deal with um, either you know, newer symptoms of depression or some people obviously have more of a history, anxiety, anything along those lines. Uh, we have a mental health counselor who comes into the facility once a week and she's able to actually meet with people individually, typically spends an hour or so with them just to offer that additional support. That's been very helpful for people. Um, we have obviously ongoing activities here in the building just to try to fill people's days to cut back on the isolation. Uh, we have a full calendar of events going on that we're able to do 
while we social distance, while we wear masks. Uh, anytime uh, residents leave their room, they have to have a mask on as a safety precaution. Um, you know, we're all tested regularly here. Uh, the vaccines have been given to people that want them here. So trying to stay as safe as we can. Um, certainly I'm available to do one-on-one -on -one visits with people, offer support as much as I can. So we're just trying to work with the situation as best we can. Um, you know, spend a lot of time talking with families, trying to update them certainly understand their frustrations that they can't actually get in here sometimes and see people and know exactly what's going on. So we try to follow up with families as quickly as we can when they have questions or concerns. And I think in general, that's about it for, for my information today. I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. Kathy, I was just going to go ahead and ask you, have you noticed um, working in the long term care field that the clients with COVID, like not that they have COVID, but with the um, pandemic occurring and them being isolated from their family, have you noticed a decline in their um, well being just from not being having contact with their family? Yeah. Yes, yes. Overall, I would say definitely, definitely. And we're trying to be proactive and address that. But yeah, we can't replace their families, obviously. So it's yeah. it's very difficult. Absolutely. And and do you think in long term care they've been utilizing more like FaceTime or Skype or other mechanisms? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As I said, we, we use the tablets, we do the Zoom meetings, we do whatever we can. We use the telehealth with the site groups here. Um, yeah, anything along those lines. That's been a huge change for us too. A learning curve for me too. I'm not very familiar with some of these things. So, you know, I'll, I'll learn along with everybody else. And I think that's a great point to make is that um, all of businesses working with older adults have had to adapt and add new technologies to their repertoire. And, and I think if the older adults understand that we're learning as we go along <laughs> as well, Right, um, right. So we're just trying to all stay on a positive note and stay connected. And I think that's a, that's a great point you made with that. Right. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and um, open it up to any questions we have about in long term care, maybe assisted living. We have Katie Clark on online as well. Um, and she represents Brookdale of Bowling Green. So it's just a little bit different perspective from um, like assisted living and long-term care. So she'll be a great added um, information to the program today. So any questions in regards to um, accessing loved ones or um, questions about long-term care assisted living with COVID? I'll, if I can share an update real quick, just a few seconds. Um, we're actually doing in-person visits. Uh, this is our second um, day doing it. Um, we're doing rapid tests with our family uh, right before the visit. They come 15 minutes early. We get the results and we can do in-person visits. It's, again, it's socially distanced, but the families can come into our community, of course, during those set times. Um, so that has been wonderful these last few days for both our assisted living and our memory care residents. So we're glad we're able to, to start that um, ball rolling. So going good so far. Perfect. And I definitely think from assisted living perspective as well, Katie, you're noticing like clients are just earning for that contact with familiar loved ones, I'm sure. The, um, they're, they're staying in consistent contact with their families through phone and um, phone and uh, FaceTime and window visits. But we noticed a huge increase in socialization when we um, yeah. have to have their rooms anymore. When they could come to the dining room, we noticed a wonderful improvement. Um, so that's the greatest, um, um, I guess, increase in socialization and everything here. Um, you know, the, it's, we've been kind of going through this a year. It's almost their routine with how they're seeing families. Um, but we've noticed a huge change um, in, in everybody's well-being and uh, motivation and all that when we started being able to eat in the dining room again with everybody. So so the families this week and the next couple of weeks um, should be even more of an improvement. So that's what we're hoping for. That's exciting. Very exciting news. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to, I think, turn it back over to Jessica. She may have a little update on that knockbox program. 
Yeah, I'm sending information right now. Oh, I guess you just got muted again. I'm sorry. Oops. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm sending the information right now in the chat. Um, so I'm going to send you a general link of more information and then also um, the application link. So it is through um, the fire department. Um, so if you can fill it out online, that's great. If you need a paper copy as well, I can send you that too. Um, that way you can um, drop it by or mail it off to them. Perfect. And Jessica, just a quick question, just to kind of clarify, is this a program that's only offered in Bowling Green area or is it something that um, Perrysburg uh, residents have access to as well? Um, it is within the city limits here in Bowling Green. Okay. So we're not too familiar if other um, municipalities maybe have that access to the knockbox program. I'm not quite sure on that, um, but this one is a loan program. Um, so that's what the application process is for, but I'm not quite sure if other areas have this. Okay, so maybe something that um, our, our participants here today are would want to reach out to their fire departments just to see if they may have access to that program. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, we're going to open the floor. Any other questions for um, our participants today? And this can be anyone here. You can go ahead and um, ask away. We have our experts. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, um, I'm not sure if she, if she was asking a question or not. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone's time on our call today or on our, our Zoom. Um, just so you know as well, um, this recording will be saved and um, will be shared on our YouTube channel, Wood County Committee on Aging, Inc. Um, I wanna just give a little bit of information on our next Care Compass program as well. We will be meeting in the month of June. It'll be June 2nd. Um, we have some great speakers lined up, the Wood County um, Hospital is providing a speaker on wound care, first aid, and when to call the ambulance. And then we have um, Carrie Kipton from Bowling Green State University, a dietitian, will be on to talk about diabetes management and caregiving. So some great topics coming up in the next um, caregiving session. So please mark your calendar for June the 2nd. That's a Wednesday, 11 to 1230. Once again, thanks so much to all of our great sponsors today, Brookdale of Bowling Green, um, Ohio Living and Home Health, Golden Care Partners, the Wood County Hospital and the Wood County Committee on Aging. So thanks again, everyone for um, stopping in today. We appreciate you. And if you have any caregiving needs, um, we're here to help you. So please reach out. Thanks again.